in your life, you deserve to be more, be more, do more, have more, and give more. And now the Becoming More podcast with Diana Kokoska. I'm so excited to have you guys on the podcast today of Becoming More because I will tell you, I know you both have become more. I got to meet you on trips. Now, I don't want to go back to the trips that we were on. We'll get to those. I want to go back to the beginning. I want you to tell your story and each of you tell them individually then we'll come together and hear how the two of you met. So Gab, let's start out with you. Well, first of all, Diana, thank you so much for having us on the show. You are such an incredible mentor, a friend, an inspiration. So just getting to spend this time with you is such an incredible honor. My story of kind of coming into the space kind of came by accident. Becoming an expert in purpose isn't exactly something you go to college for. It's not ex exactly something that you study, but... It really started for me asking a lot of those big life questions like, who am I? Where should I go? What am I supposed to do? And I think like a lot of people who probably listen to your show, I had this sense of knowing that there was something I was supposed to do with my life. I had this feeling that there was something bigger outside of just the day-to-day -day kind of grime of things. And so that question of who am I and what should I do really kind of started this curiosity early on. I was a weirdo though, just in high school. I was one of those kids who I actually had, uh, I had business cards. I had, instead of a backpack, I had a briefcase. Like I was serious. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to do something. And I remember a friend of my mom's once said, a book is the best business card you can ever give someone. I was 17 years old. So I went home and decided to write a book. So that whole journey of me me starting to write my first book at 17, go into college, really trying to figure out how I was going to make a difference in the world. In my 17-year-old brain, what I thought would make sense, I studied both politics and religion. So like the two things that you're not supposed to talk about in polite conversation, I decided to do both at the same time and kind of went through this crazy journey of really trying to find out who I was and how I was going to contribute to the world. Long story short, I got into politics, realized that I was more of the problem than the answer and kind of woke up one day and realized I needed to get some stuff straight. So through the process of really trying to discover my own purpose, I discovered along with Brian that there was this system that we could actually used to find purpose on demand, experience fulfillment like we never had, and actually turn it into something that could help other people. So a big part of my story really came from trying to figure out what problem could I solve for myself that I could package and then give to the world. You know what's interesting? So you're 17 years old. What was the name of the book? Oh my gosh, it's not even available anymore. It, it was it was a book that I wrote truly, I think, because I wanted to give and contribute to the world at large. It kind of came from a conversation I'd had with my mom and her friends, where I had many friends that were in their you know 40s and 50s. When I was in high school, I would hang out with my, with my mom and her friends. And I was like, why doesn't everybody else have mentors and friends who are of different generations? And so my book really kind of start stemmed from my own conversations with people who were older than me saying, how do we bring each other together? How do we bridge this generational gap? Well, you were way ahead of your time. There's no doubt about that. And so, Brian, tell us a little bit of your background and how you two met. I think the best place to start is about 10 years ago. And you probably know this. You've talked to a lot of amazing people. You've coached a lot of amazing people. You're you're just a special individual to both me and 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 Gabrielle. And and I've got to go back to 10 go back 10 years because I think a lot of times when we're discovering what our expertise is going to be, when we're looking at what our contribution to the world is going to be, a lot of times the beginning of that story starts in depression. It starts in pain. And, and that was the case for me. Ten years ago, I w got laid off from my dream job and divorced in the same month. And then I also had a very undealt with childhood sexual trauma from when I was seven years old. And so that was the first time in my life that I had ever experienced true deep depression, like the kind of depression where I was trying to read books to improve my situation, but I really didn't even have the motivation to move my eyes left to right. And that was the beginning of my journey, if you will, to where we are today, because I had mentors in my life. They were telling me, hey, find your purpose, find your purpose. And that's just, that sounds nice to give, but it kind of sucks to, re to receive because there wasn't a lot of how-to with that. Because I think a lot of people who can who are listening to this can relate to this is that 
the, the, the word purpose is kind of frustrating if you don't know how to leverage it or how to discover it. Its journey in terms of its process feels emotional. It feels subjective. Uh, and it feels kind of out of reach for 99% plus of people. And and for me, what I noticed, I I kind of went, I did, this is what I did. I was so frustrated with people telling me to find my purpose that I engaged in something I like to call rage research. I just, I just picked up books and I started researching kind of mad, determined to find my purpose. And here's what I noticed. What I noticed was that there were like four buckets that the experts fell into. The first bucket was there were people researching stuff related to something natural, natural giftings. The second bucket was acquired skills or skills of some sort. The third bucket was passion. And then the fourth bucket was something related to coming of age or origin story. And that was really the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey because my hypothesis was, wait a second, if there's four kind of buckets, then maybe these are the four elements to someone's purpose. And we could turn this into more of an objective process instead of a subjective emotional experience. I mean, I feel like some people think they've got to buy a trip to Hawaii or go somewhere and climb to the top of a mountain and speak to some guru sitting on a pillow to discover their purpose. I just wasn't satisfied with that. I wanted I wanted something practical that I could leverage as a decision-making tool. And this was right before Gabrielle and I uh, met, which is a fun story. This is a fun story because Gabrielle and I met uh, on Facebook. Um, I'd never, ever even I don't date it online or anything like that. It's truly a millennial love story. It, it was yeah. a millennial love story. <laughs> I, I love that, that on Facebook, I can see that, you know, I want to go back just a little bit though. Did you go around and talk about the experience that you had when you were seven or did you hold that in? And mm -hmm. do you think that's what helped cause that depression? Uh, oh, I held it in. Um, I had never uh, talked about it publicly until, I don't know, how many years in our marriage? Probably five. Five years? Yeah. Um, yeah. The first, it's a funny story. The first time I ever shared it publicly or talked about it publicly, and this was after a healing process had already kind of been engaged, um, I, I shared it in front of Air Force generals. Uh, I was doing oh, a lecture wow. in front of, I was doing a lecture in front of, in front of 500 members of the U S air force. They're all dressed in uniform. They all look stiff and, and, uh, not vulnerable. Uh, and, and for some reason I thought that was the first place I was going to share that. And, and when I did, we had Gav and I were both speaking that day to this huge group and, and we had a line of questions and I, I just, I'll never forget this. I was answering a question of which I cannot remember to this day, but Three people back, you've been in this situation before because you've spoken a lot. Three people back was was a guy that looked really angry, like a guy that looked like he had a tough question or a critique. And I saw him coming and I'm like, here we go, right? So the guy comes up to me, finger up and goes, listen, thank you for the courage that you had to share that story because you just gave me permission to deal with a very similar set of circumstances. I want to thank you for yeah. doing that for me. I, I want to have our listeners hear that too, because I think a lot of people, they hold things in mm. because they don't want anyone else to know. And yet they are living with a little bit of depression in their life. And I've heard, instead of saying depressed, say it's deep rest, deep mm. rest from who we're being to who we desire to be. And that's what you help people with. You help them bring out their giftedness, bring out what their calling or their purpose is. And as I read your book, I was enthralled in the fact that you made it so simple for people to truly understand that they have a gift and you give them permission to open that gift up. So I want to go into some of the things that I mean, you've stood in front of uh, military officials, you've helped celebrities, uh, you've been to Fortune 50 executives, and you've stood right in their face and kind of told them what they needed to hear, where everybody else kind of said, yes, yes, sir, whatever. Talk to us about how do you help people really discover that purpose? Well, I can I can jump in a bit on this. I know Brian's going to come in with his own perspective. It's for us, we really see the role of purpose discovery as essential to every single leader. Purpose for too long has been this fluffy thing. We think that purpose for a lot of people actually is put on this pedestal. It's like you're lucky to find your purpose or it's part of this elite class of people who are 
rich enough that they can go on some vacation or go to some conference or have enough time on their calendar to find their purpose. But we want, we're on a mission to democratize purpose. We believe every single person, no matter who you are, where you come from, or where you're at in your life, you deserve to find your purpose. And I think especially post-pandemic leaders have really started to realize that there's a shift in responsibility when it comes to the role that they need to play as leaders. No longer is it this transactional relationship where you as a leader or as an, as an owner need to just give someone a paycheck and hope they show up every day. Their expectation has changed from transaction to transformation. And that's a big role that Brian and I have played is how do we come in and help leaders, number one, understand the ROI of purpose. We understand what it looks like to make sure that the bottom line looks good because we, not just in spite of, but because of purpose discovery at work. We want to make sure leaders know that their people aren't going to quit when they find their purpose. They're going to stay because they find their, find their purpose. And the third thing we want to do is we want to lead a movement. We really believe there's a purpose economy we're right on the brink of that people are going to join companies because they can find their purpose, stay at companies because they find their purpose, increase their productivity, creativity, you name it. His purpose really is the cornerstone of so many of the incredible things that I think people are really looking for. Yeah, for me, I when I help people, I think of it through the lens of what I call purpose integrated decision making. Purpose integrated decision making because purpose is not just the best of what I have to help others. That's what purpose is, by the way. Purpose is the best of what you have to help others. But the second thing that it is, is it's your primary decision-making tool when you know the specificity of your purpose. So I, I look at it this way, that all of personal development is about making better decisions because making great decisions accelerates time and making bad decisions wastes time and slows down time. So if I can help people make better decisions according to their purpose, then I can help them become successful faster and live a life of fulfillment faster. Well, I know a lot of CEOs have you come into their companies and actually help their employees. What have they found production-wise after the people discover their purpose? There is a fascinating amount of studies and numbers related to the performance of employees after they individualize, they take their purpose and they individualize the mission and the core values of the organization to their purpose. And that's the key thing. There's one study just from McKinsey, got three fascinating numbers from this study. 87% of employees surveyed in that study said if they feel that their purpose is individually connected to the mission of the organization, they plan to stay for the long term. 94% of those uh, employees surveyed said if their purpose was connected to the mission, they would recruit their friends to work at the same company. And then the third number was 93% said that if their purpose as employees and team members was connected to the mission and core values of the organization, that it would have a positive impact on the customer experience. Retention is a cost saver. It's a money maker. Recruiting is a cost saver and it's a money maker. And a positive customer experience is a cost saver and a money maker. And that's the disconnect for a lot of leaders. They don't think that purpose has an ROI, but purpose really is an economic engine. And what a lot of them need to know is that performance is downstream from purpose. Purpose is not downstream from performance. Performance is downstream from, from purpose. That's the way it works. And the last thing I'll say on that is there's another study that shows that 74 or 75% of leaders feel that purpose is important to the culture of an organization, but only roughly 35% of those same leaders use it in their decision making. And what that illustrates is a gap. They know it's important, but they don't know tactically how to actually leverage it in their decision making. So they're caught in this trap by not knowing and understanding how to make decisions. I know that in research, I just recently read that 94% of the American workers are actually under stress. Do you find that with them finding their purpose that it takes that stress away or at least alleviates it? Absolutely. When you find your purpose, your locus of control goes from outside to internal. When you don't know your purpose, you're blaming everything and anyone. It's the traffic's fault. It's it's the tra uh, fault of the traffic that you're not there. It's the fault of your partner for not getting you. It's the the fault of of the landscaper for getting you know making you late to work. Whatever that looks like. So many times when we don't know purpose, we're looking to blame anyone and anything for why we're not where we're supposed to 
be. However, when you find your purpose, that locus of control goes from out there to in here. And what happens is you start to realize that you're far more in control of your happiness, your fulfillment, your direction, your clarity. And that's really what I think is so powerful about what happens when you find your purpose at work. Purpose is vocation agnostic. Some people really think, oh, if I lose my job, then I'm no longer in my purpose. Or if I take a gap year, or maybe there's a season, maybe you stayed home to, to be with your kids, you no longer have purpose. That's just not true. Purpose is vocation agnostic. Purpose is the best of what you have to help other people. So it's not you're more in your purpose at a particular job or less at your purpose in a, in a, in a different job or company. It's really in, in asking, how can I use the best of what I have at this job in this company within this industry? Those are the types of questions that we get so excited about working with companies around because I think that just by providing a platform to have these deep seated conversations, you elevate yourself, not only in the minds of your employees, but I think you you have a huge platform to change their lives, their families and in their communities. You're definitely passionate about that. And when people start believing that the external world is more important than the internal world, that's when their life really gets messed up. And what y'all are helping them do is truly understanding that that internal world, it comes from the inside and you make the external world what you desire for it to be. So let's say I'm an employee. I'm I'm there working and do you come in and work one-on-one -on -one with people? Do you work in groups? What exactly do you do when you go into a company to help people discover their purpose? Diana, you know this better than anybody else, that for an organization to change, the top has to change. And then once you get the top to change, you can get the bottom to change. You can get the entire organization to change. It really goes back to the principle of the law of the lid. So every time we go into a company, it has to start at a leadership level. So sometimes that means like I may coach an executive or a founder to make sure that his or her head is right and they're clear on purpose. Because if if leadership is influence, if everything rises and falls on leadership, then purpose is the determining factor as to whether or not you're going to be a successful leader. Okay, leadership rises and falls on purpose. So, and you know this, right? Because if a, if a leader is not specifically clear about their purpose, they're going to be an insecure leader. If a leader is crystal clear on his or her purpose, they're going to be a secure leader. Secure leaders are psychologically safe leaders. Psychologically safe leaders actually lead their people to be more creative. And insecure, insecure leaders are fear-based leaders, and they actually stifle creativity. So it starts at the top. We work with people one on one at the executive level, executive level, or we also uh, will come into an organization and work with an entire executive team and leadership team to make sure that that team is right before we seek to distribute purpose across an entire organization. Because there's nothing worse than a leader who is obviously in their patterns and in what they tolerate, not at all interested in purpose, and then that same leader telling his or her people, "Hey." You should find your purpose because you got these people that want to come in and help you. You need it. I, I mean, I don't, I'm good, you, but but you need it. Exactly. Yeah, you need That's it, right? So their audio and their visual just doesn't match, right? It's like going to the movies and that audio is a little bit off sync. Well, then mm -hmm. they pick that up in a leader as well. Yet I know that you have actually gotten into the face of some of those leaders and help them understand how important it is that they really help their people. Can you tell us any examples of some of the things that you've had to do to actually get the leader to discover their own purpose? So uh, Gab would tell you that I am known for um, breaking, making leaders cry. He definitely makes yeah. leaders cry. I mean, we will do a lot of co teaching, co-collaborating, co-consulting, and the amount of times where I've left the room to get a snack or working with somebody or having a conversation and I come in and and everyone is crying in the room. I'm like, you broke that. What happened? Uh, because I think of of what you just do so naturally and so brilliantly, which is getting to that corner cornerstone of decision-making and clarity. Right. And, and, and here's what it comes down to. If a leader is not being a good leader, it's because they have a faulty decision-making tool that's based in an undealt with childhood story of origin. So for here's a quick example, 80 plus percent of people's childhood origin story is that of rejection. They were rejected by a father figure or a mother figure very actively, very passively. 
And here's what happens. We tend to unhealthily seek as an adult what we weren't given as a child. And when we find our purpose, we tend to healthily give what we weren't given. So when a leader is struggling in their own leadership capacity, it's because they might be unhealthily seeking affirmation to the degree of narcissism to satisfy the wound that's been undealt with from their childhood. And they're actually doing something that I call making decisions by default. Making decisions by default is when we make decisions based on fear. We're actually trying to protect ourselves from our number one fear. So if your number one origin story is rejection, your number one fear as adult is going to be rejection. And the way that people kind of protect themselves from rejection as an adult uh, is, is really three things, people pleasing, perfectionism, and procrastination. They're essentially brothers and sisters of the same problem and the same protection mechanism. But what's fascinating is people pleasing is what you do to protect yourself from rejection when you're with people. Perfectionism is what you do to protect yourself from rejection before you see people. And procrastination is just avoiding seeing people. So if people are people pleasing, which mm -hmm. I've met a lot of those types of people, do you bring that up to them or do you just help them discover their purpose and kind of let that take care of itself? It's very interesting, right? You're, you're well trained in, um, uh, practical psychology and, and, and so, so are we, and you, you know, that some leaders can't handle the direct feedback. They're not ready for it. And, and so, uh, for me, I have to creatively move conversations to personal revelation. And oftentimes that's very Socratic where we actually lead them to their own conclusion. And the truth is, is if they come to the conclusion themselves, as opposed to me directly giving them the conclusion that they're unhealthily seeking affirmation and people pleasing and, and they're making decisions based on fear. If I finger wag like that, it doesn't always work. So for me, I, sometimes I can use analogies. Sometimes I can use metaphors, uh, or some kind of Socratic Q and a to get them to come to that realization. And oftentimes what, what I like to do is, is, is help them see a pattern that was existent in their childhood that was reflective of that decision-making and then see the same pattern played out in their adulthood. That is the exact same pattern because more often than not, um, you, you will literally see somebody not realize that they are acting the same way they were when they were a child. An example would be, I was working with this, uh, incredible female executive. Uh, it was a zoom call. And she she had a heavy uh, storyline of rejection with her father. And I, I asked her, I said, okay, so when you felt most rejected by your father, you got in an argument with him, what would happen? She's like, I would go to my room and I would close the door. Her default emotion was like sadness and shutdown. And then like 35 minutes later in the conversation to kind of clear the mental palate, if you will, she was having an issue with a uh, a male superior who I knew reminded her of her father. And I said, so what happens when you get kind of in a, in a tiff with your male superior, with your, with your CEO? She's like, yeah, you know, what I usually just do is I check out of the situation and I just go to my office and I cl close the door. And I said, did you hear that? Because 35 minutes ago, you told me you did that when you were a kid. So this is an undealt with trigger area for you that when you feel rejected, you let sadness and shutdown take over and you go into that um, you go into sometimes people pleasing, but you go into that sadness and shut down place and operate from a position of fear instead of operating from a position of purpose. And Diana, you know this too, that so much of our job as leaders and consultants and coaches is to come in and really act like a mirror for us to be able to say, here's something in your life directly is not going to either be effective or be respectful. So a lot of what we do is just hold a mirror up. Oftentimes these are questions, although so simple, like what Brian was just walking through as this example is so simple, but many of us have not given ourselves the permission to sit in that white space to say, what are the things that are triggering? What are the things that are fulfilling? How is this impacting the way that I show up in the world? And I think a lot of times we've had such clear delineations between work and home life. And now, you know, everything really is so blended together that I think people are realizing it's not just me working from home. I've been bringing home with me to work for decades. What have those influences been? And not just bringing home uh, to work, but bringing some of those traumas and triggers from my childhood. And so giving people an opportunity to be able to self-assess and self-heal, I think is a really powerful part of what we're really looking to do. I like what you said about putting the mirror up in front of them so they self-discover and you just allow people to be who they desire to be. You give them the space 
to be that person, to be transparent. And I think it's because you're not judgmental. You allow them to say whatever they need to say. So let's say right now, somebody has your book. Would they contact you and start asking you questions? How would they get in contact with you to find out their own purpose? Yeah, a big part of what we love to do is create community. So you know, for your audience, we have a free step into your purpose guide that they can text the word purpose to 33777. And we're giving them a free guide that walks them through step by step how to step into their purpose. But of course, they can spend time by connecting with us on LinkedIn. Brian and I really love creating great content and giving back. So if someone were to pick up our book, The Purpose Factor, you can pick it up at Amazon and purposefactor.com, pur purposefactorbook.com. But if they're really looking for how do I walk through this system, how do I walk through that set, I think LinkedIn is one of our favorite ways that we get to continue conversations with people. You know, I had an opportunity to see you present down in Orlando, Florida at a John Maxwell event. And I've got to say, the two of you really captivate the audience and you have them right on the edge of their seat, desiring to have more. Now, when you speak and you're out there, Tom Ziegler said, next generation of motivational titans. What was it that brought the two of you together that you're able to speak together so well without stepping on each other or one of you wanting to take over? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's speaking together is is a ton of it's a ton of fun, and a lot of people think that it's one of those things where yeah, I just can stand next to a person on stage and we can effectively communicate uh, at the same time. It is actually it's an art. It's an art that has to be studied because you have to learn when you're when you're communicating as kind of a duo. You have to learn to trust each other, both from a um, uh, what they're saying perspective, but how they're moving. You so. You, you kind of learn that if somebody steps forward, then you need to step back and let them speak. If somebody briefly interrupts you, go ahead and end your point and let them step in and talk. And it becomes kind of this like back and forth kind of dance in terms of communication. And it, it's an art and it takes practice. But the, the reason Gavin and I like to do it is because um, we have uh, complementary gifts and skill sets. Uh, you know, if you ask me a question, you're going to get a principle and a story. And if you ask Gav a question, you're going to get a, a number. A number. Yeah. Absolutely. By the time that Brian's done with answering the question, I'm like, I could have answered three questions from then, from, from That's by true. that, That's very at that true. point. But it really is kind of that flow. And, and I think kind of coming back to purpose too, because we have so many people who will come up to us after we speak and we speak all over the world. I'm like, oh, I'd love to do that with my partner. Oh, we love, you know, my partner and I, we love doing that too. We love speaking together. And I think it's an incredible thing. But what really brings us together, Diana, is that purpose piece is we know that it's worth it because we know that we are better together and we have this really dovetailed purpose, which we're really, really um, blessed and excited to be able to share with the world. But but that's the big thing is like answering that question, is it going to be worth it? Because we know that we really are better together, that we both have these kind of unique uh, perspectives on purpose, that when we come together, there's something that Brian's going to say that's going to resonate with someone that's going to be different than maybe when I say it's going to resonate differently with people. And so that's really one of the the blessings to be a, a husband-wife duo. Well, I've got to tell you, you two are the best that I've seen because a lot of husbands and wives, they don't get along even on stage. So <laughs> has there ever been a time, I want to uh, dig a little bit deep here. Has there ever been a time when you maybe didn't see eye to eye in the business world? Um, uh, tons, oh, yeah. uh, plenty of times. And in <laughs> fact, and Gab, Gab and I have been married, uh, going on nine years, uh, knowing each other for 10 years. And we didn't start working together full time until about two years into our marriage and uh, working together as co-founders, especially, uh, has taken a lot of practice and a lot of emotional discipline, if you will. Cause yeah, I, I remember, uh, I had a business when we got married, Gabrielle had a business when we got married, two separate businesses. And m mine was the one I made all my mistakes on. And it wasn't that profitable. And Gab's like, Hey, you know, maybe you should think about getting a job, uh, or, uh, trying harder. Uh, and I was like, uh, okay, um, how about this? What if we work together? And Gab's like, no. And I said, well, what about this? Gab, A, a thriving speaking business and training business at the time she's in this. I'll make you a deal. Let's test out working together. I'll be your I'll be your speech booker. 
And I, I made a big promise. I said, I'll double your speaking business in the first year that we worked together. And I so did deliver on that, that promise, oh. but I, yeah, I, I did. I delivered on that promise, but I, uh, I, I came in like a bull in a China shop and I wrecked the China shop. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think, and, and you didn't just double it, you tripled it. Oh yeah. He, he came in and, and, and he killed it. He did it incredible, but, but yes, there were those moments. And I think that why we do so well together now is because we've learned to really be for each other. I think that's been the biggest thing is to say, no matter what, no matter what he's doing, working on, et cetera, I'm for him. I'm his biggest fan. Like we're sitting here in the studio. I'm like, good job, honey. That's awesome. You look hot. You know, all of those things, because I'm so for him, the same things when we're consulting or speaking on stage or all those things. And so that's something that I think recognizing that no matter what, at the end of the day, we're married first, business partners second. And so keeping things in that right priority. But again, coming back to the purpose piece is, you know, last night was date night. We talked just as much about us and, you know, and our relationship as we did our business and what's next for us. And so that conversation for us really has always flowed together really easily. I think this is real important because in real estate, there's many husband and wife teams. The wife generally gets into real estate and then the man comes along and says, hey, let me help you in your business. You're doing so well. And they come in and want to take over. I can't tell you as a coach and my husband being a coach, how many times we've had to help fire the spouse. And I just watch the two of you and the things that you do. And everyone that's listening to this podcast if you are a husband and wife working together, get these two to help you with your purpose, because I do believe that is what really is the glue that holds the two of you together, because you respect each other's purpose. And as you said, you love each other first, and then you're in business second. So I want to go back to this powerhouse thing, though, because... Uh, well, Gabrielle, you are a powerhouse. There is no doubt about that. And Brian, you just come right along with full force. So Brian, I had the great opportunity to meet you first. We were actually on the plane riding with John Maxwell and his team to Paraguay and Brazil to help teach people values. Now, you were a powerhouse. I knew I wanted to get to know you better. I got to hear about purpose and all the great things that you were doing. Yet I know from losing a job, going through a divorce, you just didn't all of a sudden become an overnight success. Share with us some of the challenges that you and Gabrielle have had and how you have become more. I'll tell you what, if, um, if, if overnight success is a thing, then the overnight part's really long. Um, it's a long night before if it's an overnight success, um, because I know, I think you know this, that dreams take decades, real dreams that are big enough to challenge you. They, yes. they take decades and it, it wisdom is something that is probably no different than uh, making wine. It's gotta be pressed down and it's got to have time to age in the barrel. It needs to, and in the bottle for that matter, that great things don't happen overnight. Wisdom doesn't happen overnight. Perspective doesn't happen without experience. All of those things have to gather together with skills and, and then be applied to practical circumstances. And, and that's not something that happens in a week or in 24 hours uh, or even in a year. Uh, because I think experience also has to be tested by outside kind of macro cycles, like economic cycles can really test whether or not the wisdom you have works in both an up cycle and a down cycle. Yeah, I think the commitment thing for us was so important, knowing that we were going to follow through with it, having started our own companies separately in our 20s and coming together in our late 20s and into our 30s, starting something and building it together. I think we really did see the importance of believing in what we were building. I think a lot of times people are pop-up successes. They're pop-up coaches, pop-up authors, like, let me try this, let me try that. And I really believe that the compound effect of wisdom that Brian was talking about was really starting to made, man, made manifest in our lives. I mean, Brian and I even now have a very limited social media presence intentionally because we were working underground for a decade. We wanted to make sure that we were worthy of the mountaintop. It would have been easy for us to buy the followers, have a flashy podcast, do all of these 
these things, but really it's us a decade in saying now we're finally ready to present this thing to the world. And I think so oftentimes people feel the pressure of comparison of this is what I should be doing. Like we joke around about not shitting all over yourself. Like we have this expectation of what I should do. I should do this. I should do that. And it really does hurt your confidence, clarity, and direction. And so for us, we wanted to make sure whatever we did, whether it was a book, a program, a company, any of those things, that it was really worthy of being presented to the world. We really wanted something of value. And you know this, your your life is such a testament of it, Diana, that, that whenever you're working with someone, the most important thing you're taking from them is their time. And if you're doing something, if you're standing in front of someone speaking or them listening to this podcast or reading your book or working with you as a coach, every single thing that we're taking from someone is time. We wanted to do something that was truly worthy of that exchange. Well, it's so important. And the thing that I really admire about both of you is the amount of research that you do. You just didn't write a book and say, here you go. You didn't use AI to write the book. How many years did you do the research and how how challenging was that? By the time we put out the purpose factor as a book, we had been researching purpose for six years. Mm -hmm. um, so it is it is not one of those books where like, I think I'm gonna write a book on purpose and make a bunch of uh, opinionated conclusions that may or may not be right. And, and to me, uh, there, listen, there's a difference between grape juice and fine wine. There's a huge difference. Grape juice is kind of gross, right? Grape juice is kind of like, let's just squeeze the juice out of these grapes and put it in a bottle, grape juice, overnight, right? That's overnight success. The idea of that is grape juice. When it comes to real wisdom and expertise, it's fine wine. Three, four, five bunches of grapes have to be pressed down, fermented, aged in a barrel, put in a bottle, aged in the bottle, and then enjoyed. And that's the difference. I think there's a lot of people today um, that really have grape juice content and they don't have fine wine content. And it's because today has convinced people that brand is more important than value. But you don't need a brand if you don't have value. Value has to come first, brand comes second. Because the first problem in business is to, to solve for is monetization. The second problem is brand and, and notoriety. Um, but if you have brand before you have value, you're, you're, you're creating notoriety, but you can't point people to anything. Well, and all of the research that you've done and the things that you've acquired, that is your brand. Mm. I mean, a lot of people spend a lot of money saying, look at me and how great I am. I think when you're great, you don't need to spend a lot of money. It just starts happening organically. And I know that you guys work at everything that you do. And yet at the same time, when people see you speak, when they work with you, the referrals have got to be coming in like crazy. Oh my goodness. I, I, we, <laughs> you, you know, this oh, Diana, yeah. cause we talked about it and Gab, uh, with our purpose factor assessment, but actually probably by the time that, uh, your listeners are hearing this podcast, they'll be able to access our purpose factor assessment, which is the first assessment right. in the world, uh, a scalable purpose discovery tool, uh, that we're releasing, uh, uh, very, very soon because it goes back to this idea of Gab saying, we need to democratize purpose. We've got to we've got to make purpose discovery not a 1% thing, but a 99% thing where every person has the ability uh, to discover their purpose. But again, that doesn't happen overnight either. It's one of those things that we weren't able to produce uh, a, an assessment based on deep research to help people discover their purpose in a scalable way until a, a decade into researching. Yeah, and, and that component of sharing is such an important element to measure. So many times people, we measure our output, we measure our results, we measure how much something's costing us, but how many people measure their referrals. I know in your industry, that's such a big part of it. But in most in, in, in most instances, in most industries, people aren't actually measuring their effectiveness by the talkability of whatever it is that they're sharing. Mm -hmm. Every single time Brian and I put anything together, whether it's one of our TED Talks or a book or, or, or this assessment, everything is, what is someone going to say about this? And so it's that core principle of, of 
beginning with the end in mind? How do we make sure that whatever it is that we create is actually set to scale? Is it designed to actually go beyond? And is it something that's very easily for, easy for someone to take in and take with them and share it with their own circle of influence? Well, you definitely are the luxury people when it comes to purpose. I know that. And with this assessment, Let's just talk about it for a moment because it took you quite a while to put together and to make certain that it actually works and it helps people find their purpose. When I take the assessment, is it going to take me a long time to take it? It's one of those assessments where you can answer the questions, depending on how fast you answer questions, in about 20 to 30 minutes. And what it's going okay. to do is, is give you a couple of things. Uh, it's going to break your purpose down into four elements. And each of those elements have like five archetypes underneath each of them. And, and what it's going to provide to the end user like yourself is one of 625 unique combinations. And in addition to a no, full wait, report. Wait, on... just a minute. One of 625. Correct. I, I want our listeners to really hear that. Because this isn't just um, assessment that, hey, I hope you find your purpose. This is really in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, 625 unique combinations. And it's not just a report on the four elements. It also is going to give the end user a unique combination of core values and core beliefs as well. And then this was something that took a ton of work from a research and a programming standpoint, but it's actually going to be able to spit out a unique purpose factor statement for you and a unique fulfillment factor statement for you based on your four elements. So you will actually be able to understand your purpose in a singular statement and understand when you're going to be most fulfilled in a single statement. The combination also of those two statements, 625 possible combinations. So you're going to be able, you're going to have a report, almost 50 pages that if you want, if you want to know one thing and only one thing from your, from your report, you'll know your exact purpose in a statement. If you want to know all the depth and details and how it affects your leadership and your decision making, what's most fulfilling, what's most frustrating to you, you can know that as well. So you're going to help me find my giftedness. In essence, you're going to help me find more energy in my mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. Because when they're in that gift zone, when we're all in the gift zone, we have more energy and we can give more to people. This is amazing. So how do they find the assessment? Yeah, so probably in the show notes here for the podcast, you're going to be able to find our, our our assessment in the show notes, but you'll also be able to find our assessment on our website at purposecompany.com. Now, will everybody get to see this? Let's say my uh, the president of the company says, hey, Diana, I want you to get this assessment done. It's going to help you with your purpose. Will they be able to see my purpose as well, or will it just come to me? It'll come to you uh, because we understand that organizations are a little bit different. You know, uh, some organizations are built on transparency and some organizations are not built on so much transparency. So the way that the assessment report is delivered is unique to you, the user, uh, and it's up to the leadership and the employee how they want to engage in sharing that. But even if, if you just take the first element of your purpose, your natural advantage, the role you tend to play in life and work, that is an incredible tool for a leader to understand how an individual employee is going to be most fulfilled in the work that they're doing. In fact, that element alone is a phenomenal tool for teams to actually make sure that they have team alignment, that the right people are on the team, uh, the right people are sitting in the right positions on the team, and that all of the necessary things, uh, all the things that are necessary for a team to be effective are actually accounted for across multiple archetypes. And one of the things that we're most excited about is having a leader be able to take their assessment, find out what their purpose is, their core values, how they mm -hmm. make decisions based off of their purpose, and then being able to be trained, which is what we're doing a lot of right now is working with leaders and training them how to lead other people based off of their purpose factor. Because the key to purpose is fulfillment. So many times we talk about the importance of purpose and the power of purpose, and that's a big thing that drives us. But a lot of times people, what they're really looking for when they say, I'm trying to find my purpose, they're really saying, I want to know what fulfills me. And so if you as a leader know what's going to fulfill every single person on your team, you don't have turnover issues, you don't have focus issues, you don't have productivity issues, you don't have disengagement issues, you just have a fully engaged, fully present team. 
Well, every single person is going to want this because, I mean, retention, recruitment. Uh, the reason I brought this up is you mentioned rejection earlier. And a lot of times, if people think someone else is going to read something about them before they get to read it themselves, they have that little hesitancy, a chance to stand back, to say, I'm not sure I want someone else knowing more about me than I know yeah. about myself. So when you're listening to this, just think about how great that would be. Let's talk about that word fulfillment for just a moment, because that's something that a lot of people dream about, yet do they truly understand what that means in their life? Yeah, purpose is the best of what you have to help others, but fulfillment is the result of helping others with the best of what you have. And there's there's three key ways that people can receive fulfillment in their life. The first one is through gratitude. So if you take the time to mentor somebody for a year, and they come back to you three years later and said, I'm making four times as much as I was when I first started with you. I got married. My relationships are thriving, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they say, thank you so much. That right there for you is a gratitude-driven fulfillment feedback loop. The second one is giving. It's gratitude, giving, and growth. The second one being giving means you may not get recognized or thanked for your contribution, but you're going to get to observe the result of what you gave. And then finally, your personal growth, qualitatively, quantitatively, you're getting better in your life. That's also a fulfillment feedback loop. And here are the two primary reasons uh, people don't experience deep fulfillment. And I know that to be true because I ask people all the time, what's your most fulfilled day at work? And I often get a blank stare or, or somebody kind of like says, uh, it's the, uh, the day that my daughter graduated high school. And that's nice. That's a wonderful family moment but it's not necessarily indicative of your most fulfilled day at work, your most fulfilled day in your life. People aren't fulfilled because of one of two reasons. One, they don't know their exact purpose, so they can't consistently give the best of what they have to the right person. And then second, they actually don't know how to receive fulfillment, so they can't consistently receive the thing that ultimately is going to feed their long-term motivation and conviction. Do you think it's because they don't believe they just that deserve to have that fulfillment or is it from their childhood we are on it we we are in a massive self-worth deficit mm -hmm. as a society we are in a self-worth deficit and and a lot of that's because and and if you just look at this generationally i think it's uh, i think people get a little too crazy about how much they blame their parents for 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 their issues but if you look at this from a generational perspective boomers and older xers targeted a lot of their life towards, say, materialism and, and actually modeling that for their kids. And what it starved that next generation of, the pursuit of materialism by parents will starve kids of meaning. That's the gap. And meaning is the source That's of self-worth and confidence. And so we really are in a desert of self-worth. We're in a desert of self-esteem. Uh, we're in a desert of confidence. And confidence, self-worth, self-esteem, conviction, motivation, all finds its source in certainty. If I can go deeper on that, it finds its source in truth. You've got to know truly with certainty who you are, your purpose. You've got to know with certainty what you're doing, your target. You've got to know with certainty the steps it's going to take to initially get started uh, to achieve it. I love that you asked that question because we really are in this deficit of self-worth and, and, and it's, it's actually, this is some of our most recent research. It's that it's this pursuit of materialism that starves meaning. This is so good. And I'm glad that we're talking about this right now, because in uh, Victor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, I think they have lost the meaning of their life. And you mentioned that it would help their confidence to know their purpose. What great energy that confidence is, how much better people look with confidence. That alone is a reason they should take the assessment. When you help people with their purpose, what have you seen in their confidence and how has it grown? Do you have any research on that? The confidence piece, I think, is one of the most clear before and afters in the matter of 30 minutes. 
before oh, finding wow. your finding your purpose. Mm-hmm. So we've we've seen that actually where people have gone through this process before taking the assessment where they've they've come in and maybe they've, you know, their their shoulders have kind of been sunk in, sunken in. Their their face faces cold the worry of the day. They've they've seemed anxious or frustrated and and lacking control and lacking clarity because confidence really finds itself in clarity. And so finding their purpose through taking this purpose factor assessment, we've seen how powerful people then stand, their bodies change, they have more clarity in their eyes, their their shoulders are stronger. And what's so amazing is not just the physicality of, oh my gosh, this person has more confidence, but they feel more empowered because data helps people make better decisions. If you have more data about what's going to fulfill you, you're going to feel better about taking that job and saying no to that other job, even though it's more money. If you have more data about what's going to most fulfill you, then you're going to have more confidence making sure that you're targeting your focus and your energy around marketing your your business in, in a different way. And you're going to feel really good about it, even if it isn't what's popular or what other people are telling you to do. If you have more data about what your core values are, you're going to feel much better about surrounding yourself with the types of mentors, friends, and partners that are going to make you feel really good. So that's really where I think so much of confidence comes from is clarity and who you are where you're going and how you're going to get there. Have you found that it's helped with the anxiety that a lot of people have? Yeah, I mean, you you really have, yes, solid yes, because you really at any given time have two voices that you can choose from in your mind. Anxiety is the voice of fear, okay? Purpose is a voice of conviction. If the voice of fear is speaking louder than the voice of conviction, you cannot be successful. If the voice of conviction is speaking louder than the voice of fear, you can be successful and you can experience fulfillment. That kind of exists on a seesaw, okay? Because it's not like one of those voices, if I have enough conviction or if I know my purpose really, really clear, then I'll never experience a temptation to be fearful or dip into anxiety. It's just which voice is speaking louder, conviction, or fear, conviction or fear. And and that really is kind of the source, the source material for anxiety and depression uh, is when the voice of fear has convinced you something untrue about yourself and you've 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 agreed with that thing. You bought into it. When did you discover your purpose? I discovered my, I guess I get to be, we get to be the purpose people, right? So uh, for for us, um, I knew at about a year and a half to two years into researching purpose that undeniably uh, my purpose was to make purpose the world's number one decision-making tool, that I had to democratize purpose like Gabrielle was talking about, that I had to turn purpose into a process, not just some emotional woo-woo uh, journey. Uh, so that that for me happened about eight years ago when I knew the power of it uh, and when I knew it could be turned into something that was practical for everyone to do. Yeah, I think it was a, definitely a a moment. I think sometimes people think that they're going to, you know, climb to the top of a mountain and have this purpose moment, or maybe they're going to have this moment in the shower. They're going to be on this walk and all of a sudden, you know, something really, really, you know, is, is, shown to them. And and it wasn't necessarily that for us. For us, when things really click, like what Brian said, it was this duality of us both realizing that we are perfectly situated to solve the problem of the purpose deficit. So for, for listeners, we hope that you can check out the purpose factor assessment. It's definitely worth your while. It's worth your 30 minutes. But if I were to give you something just to think about right now is to focus on what problem in the world am I drawn to solve? Mm -hmm. That is the foundational element of why purpose is so powerful is purpose isn't about you. It's some good news out there that, that it's not about you. It's not about how you feel. It's not about what makes you happy. It's about what you can give to the world. And when Brian and I looked at each other and we when we had that that excitement because we realized what we can give to the world was what we had just solved for ourselves. So much of what purpose is is giving to the world what we wish we were given. And so really finding that on the other side of our own journey of discovering that purpose wasn't only discoverable and accessible, but it was also too shareable and scalable. We realized that we not only had an opportunity to share this system with the world, we had a duty to share it with the world. 
you have an obligation to share it. Now, what is the difference between purpose and calling? Phenomenal, phenomenal uh, question. Um, personally, uh, they're pretty close to one and the same. Um, purpose and calling is really an articulation from a definition place, a reason for being. But for, for a lot of folks, that isn't helpful. Just reason for being is not helpful. So we had to turn purpose almost visually into a toolkit. And then when you have a toolkit, then you can develop your mission. What's your target? What are you going to point the toolkit at? And, and, and I talk about, I mean, people can live really in four zones. They can live in a calling zone. They can live in a comfort zone. They can live in a confused zone. And they can live in a coping zone. And you're in the utmost of your calling zone when you're doing something that is worth it. And you're doing something that is hard, something that's a challenge, something that makes you better. If you're in your comfort zone, you're doing something that's worth it, but you're playing it safe and you're playing it easy. If you're confused, you're probably doing something hard that you feel is not worth it. And if you're in your coping zone, you're probably doing something that's easy and not worth it. And the goal there is to live in your calling zone in every element of your life, your health, your relationships, your wealth, your business, your spirit, your mindset. You've got to get all of those points, if you will, in your calling zone so that you can support being consistent over time with what you're trying to achieve. Well, I like what you said. Knowing your purpose helps you make better decisions. And I'd like for people to make a decision, one, to take the assessment, two, buy your book, three, wherever they can hear you speak, they need to go and hear you because they'll get so much more out of it. And I'd like to hear the parting words. What great wisdom did you have to end the podcast with today? I would say from my perspective is to give yourself permission to pursue your purpose. So many leaders we meet put off finding their purpose. They wait for the perfect time. They wait for the slow season. They wait for their kids to leave for college. They wait for that relationship to, to start or that relationship to end. And I just want to let you know that there are people on the other side of your purpose discovery who are waiting and wishing that, that you had stepped into your purpose. They are desperate for what you know right now, waiting for you to step into the fullness of your purpose. And so stop waiting for permission from that person in your life. Stop waiting waiting for permission from the economy, stop waiting for permission from your calendar and to fully step into your purpose now. For me, their permission right now. That's good. Hmm. Brian. Yeah. For, for me, I Gab's heard me say this many, many times. Um, there is nothing more important in your life than discovering your purpose. And I know that maybe you're listening to this and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, it must be nice for you. I, that sure would be nice, but I got all these circumstances that I'm dealing with here. Um, that's because it used to be the case that purpose was not easily discoverable. Um, so if there's anything that I can give to you, that Gabrielle and I can give to you, it's to give you the ability to finally get clarity on the most important thing in your life. And that is your purpose, because whether you know it or not, fulfillment is possible on demand. When you know the best of what you have, you can consistently give the best of what you have. When you consistently give the best of what you have, you can consistently experience the best that life has to offer. And the best that life has to offer is deep fulfillment, to know that you matter and to know that your work matters and to ultimately know that that pursuit is worth it. Because if there's a law as immutable as gravity, it's that success demands sacrifice. And so you're going to have to decide what in your life is worth the sacrifice. Such great wisdom. I so appreciate you guys being with us today on Becoming More. And I would recommend that you listen to this two or three times. There's so much gold in here. There's so much wisdom for you to gain. And definitely tell us one more time where they get the assessment and how they contact you. You can get a hold of the Purpose Factor Assessment at PurposeCompany.com and come hang out with us on LinkedIn. We post a lot of great content on LinkedIn. It's a it's a special place for us to live a life of content contribution over there on LinkedIn. We'd love to talk to you, um, but that's that's where you can find the assessment.
Okay, thank you both so very much. And we'll see you next Tuesday again on Becoming More. And I want to thank all of our listeners for allowing us to be nominated as the number one podcast of women in podcast. Thank you so much. See you next Tuesday. In your life, you deserve to be more, be more, do more, have more, and give more. And now the Becoming More podcast with Diana Kokoska. I